Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here today. And even though it's April 10th, the weather, I think, think it's, thinks it's April 1st with all the snow. But um, hopefully, hopefully it will warm up soon. It's good to have you all here today. And uh, it's good to have my parents in town. And mom is offered to pinch hit because um, Kim is at the ER with her husband. Um, we'll uh, keep her and her husband in our prayers. Um, as indicated in the bulletin, thank you, Nancy, for the inserts, we will be having breakfast on Easter Sunday at 9.30, followed by the Easter Sunday service. And we will have Monday, Thursday service here at 7 p.m., so please uh, plan on that. And Lori, any follow-up to the fish fry? Yes. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody Hold it off. <laughs> it was uh, a little bit of a stretch at times, but um, everybody came together and everybody did a little bit here and there and did what we could. And those who needed chairs, I got them chairs and they sat and did their job so we can all still manage to pitch in and help out. Um, we do have the second fish fry. Let me start with that. The second fish fry we served of 162 dinners. Um, we had 43 takeouts, so a lot of takeouts. Um, we had tips of $42, so there was quite a bit in the tip jar. Um, so that worked out for a total profit of approximately $1,200. I still got a few bills trickling here and there, but approximately $1,200. I do have leftovers. On this last fish fry, I have a box of the shrimp that I'm going to sell for $17. There's approximately 50 shrimp, all breaded and everything, ready to go in the box. So if anybody would like a box of shrimp, let me know. I have two of them for sale. So if anybody wants them, it's $17 for the box. I have cod, the cod fillets. They haven't been cooked. They're fresh, first time for a frozen. I froze them. I packaged them up in packages of two fillets and froze them. I'm going to sell a package of two fillets for $5. Okay. 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 Uh, one package of fillets for $5. I had two fillets in it. Okay. I do have them bagged up in the refrigerator in, in, with two packages in each bag. But one package is five dollars. So if you just want two fillets, you can do that. Um, so, so they're not breaded. No. They're not breaded. They're just plain fish fillets that are, you know, they were frozen. They're frozen now, but they were fresh when we got them. So they've never been frozen before. Um, first time in the freezer, and, and they've never had breading or anything on them. So they are there for purchase. Um, as far as the fish fries all together, we only did two this year because of our dishwasher, which is now fixed and um, running very well, as Peter can attest to. <laughs> he, he, he did a great job in the dishwasher also. Um, total profit, the best that I can give you right now is around $2,500. So we did very well. So that's pretty good. We, we usually figure about a thousand dollars a fish fry and we did about twenty five hundred. So I think we did all right. So thanks for that. Thank, Thank you. And one last thing we have to do connected to the fish fry. <laughs> a lot of people were asking, when's our next dinner? They're anxious for the next dinner. And we, so I told them, look forward to the fall, that we'll do chicken and biscuits in the fall. And they were excited about that. So hopefully that'll give us a start. 
Excellent. All right. So um, let us join in our call to worship. Come, come seeking words. Come, come to find your voice. Come, come to open your ears. Come, come to be healed by the silence. Come, come to approach what words cannot describe. Let us join together in prayer. Come, O Holy One, come through the streets, come into the house, come to find a space beside us at the table, come to challenge our answers about why tragedy comes, why poverty increases, why we are afraid. Come, O Holy One, speak to us in the silence with wisdom greater than ours. Son, thank you. Come, O Holy One, fill these stories with your wisdom, with your love, with your change, so that we might rely on your answers here and now. Amen. Our first hymn is All Glory, Laud, and Honor. And there's only three verses, so we'll sing them all. But uh, moving forward, if I remember to uh, let Steve know for the slides, we'll sometimes just do three verses when there's five. But we'll do all three of this one. Let us join together in prayer. Loving God, in this season, as the sun starts coming out, the plants start growing, we thank you for signs of life and hope. We pray today for those who are sick. We pray especially for Kim's husband, that you would bring them comfort and healing. We pray that you would bring strength for the families, and we thank you for the doctors and nurses and first responders who take such good care of everyone. We pray that you would be with those who mourn. 
and that you would help us to comfort them and support them in this time. We pray also that you would help us to find ways to care for those in need, for the hungry, the homeless, the cold, for those struggling with addictions. We pray particularly for the people of Ukraine that in this time, the countries of the world would stand together for peace and justice and help bring an end to this conflict. We pray these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We are collecting our one great hour of sharing offering today, and the envelopes are in the bulletin. You can drop them in the plate on your way out. One great hour of sharing is such a wonderful program that allows many different churches and, and denominations to work together to, to support those in need. And Dad shared with me a few weeks ago how wonderful it was that funds that were donated through One Great Hour of Sharing were being shared with um, the Ukrainian churches and apparently also with the Hung Hungarian Baptist churches, which um, they're Baptist, but they're part of the Reform, World Reformed Communion, which the United Church of Christ is also part of. And so how wonderful it is that the money that is donated at and collected with the One Great Hour of Sharing can be shared when, when need arises when refugees need help, when there are disasters, and the inserts in the bulletin talk about um, tornadoes that, that hit in Ohio and how One Great Hour of Sharing funds helped with that as well. So let us take a moment to sing the doxology, and then we will, we will have a prayer for the offering. <laughs> We have several readings for today, and because it's Palm Sunday, some of the readings are longer. So uh, at, at churches that have lay readers, it's always a risky Sunday for someone to volunteer to be the, the lay reader, although at least these readings I don't think have any of the difficult words to pronounce that can be the other challenge sometimes. First reading from Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them, and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. And from the Gospel of Luke, first the reading about the Palm Sunday procession. After he said, had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, 
and as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying this colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, the people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. And then even though it's still only Palm Sunday, we have the reading from, gospel, or from the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Luke about Jesus' trial and crucifixion. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, He stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, where he began even to this place. When Jesus heard this, or when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he heard that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had been waiting to see him for a long time because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then he put on an elegant robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people. And here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he has sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. And they all shouted together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas for us! This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. The great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that have never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by, watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, 
This is the king of, Jews, of the Jews. One of the, Messiah, one of the child, criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the others rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, when the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for the spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. This is the word of the Lord. Excuse me, we're experiencing technical difficulties. There we go. So this is Palm Sunday. In the Baptist churches when I was growing up, Palm Sunday was always Baptism Sunday if there was anyone um, ready to be baptized. So my own baptism, trying to think, I think it was 1982 or 1983, um, was, was on Palm Sunday. And so that meant then that Monday, Thursday, and then the following Easter Sunday were the first times we would t- take part in communion. We covered a lot of ground in those verses because, of course, we started with the celebration as Jesus was arriving. But to keep things in context, to help us remember that Palm Sunday, that celebration, was not the end of the story, we also read that very long reading of Jesus' trial and crucifixion. Palm Sunday is described and modeled as a royal procession, the way that King David and others were welcomed to the city, and the writers of the Gospels echoed the language from the Hebrew Bible from other cases where kings were welcomed. And of course, the challenge here in the Gospel story is that there is already a king in Jerusalem. So when Jesus comes to town and people start talking about him as the king of the Jews, you can understand why King Herod might be concerned. The people at the time, the crowds, were scared. They were worried. They were overwhelmed by many concerns, particularly by the fact that they were under Roman control and living in poverty with leaders who collaborated with the Romans and keeping them in their desperate situation. So they had heard of Jesus. They had heard of his teachings. They had heard of the miracles he was performing. So as he arrived, they were understandably hopeful and excited. Now, I don't know about you, I don't always like going out in crowds. I don't mind Canal Fest because I'm usually behind the counter, even though we get very long lines of people not always being patient about waiting for their deep fried Oreos. But I don't particularly like walking in crowds because people push up near you. And crowds can change quickly between excitement and everyone being excited to be there together, to sometimes scenes of chaos. And there have been crowds at concerts or protests where people have gotten hurt and, in fact, killed by the crowds. When I was getting ready to go to Jerusalem for the year after college, 
the orient, at the orientation se session, they warned us, since sometimes there are protests and other chaotic events in Jerusalem, they told us, if you hear noise of a crowd, don't go look to see what's going on. Go the other direction. That's the safest thing to do. Of course, we didn't always do that. And there was one time that I had gone with some friends to watch the religious observances and didn't realize that the crowd was then going to move in procession to the Western Wall, the last remaining stones of Herod's temple. And it's a good thing I was willing to go in that direction because the streets are very narrow. They're, some of them are about as narrow as the walkway between these pews. And if I had wanted to go in the opposite direction, there was no way I could because there were hundreds, if not thousands of people moving in those narrow streets and I was just literally caught up with the crowd. It was a little bit scary when we got there to realize that they were not just going to pray, but they were become, it was becoming a political demonstration, demonstration Demonstrations in Jerusalem sometimes turn that way because the city of Jerusalem is uh, disputed territory, but claimed both by the Palestinians and the Israelis. And seeing as I am neither, I wasn't particularly thrilled about being caught up in a political protest that could have turned violent. So crowds can be exciting, but they can turn quickly. And that's actually what happened this, in this story of Jesus in Holy Week. But what were they coming to see? Were they coming to hear a preacher? There had been, of course, many preachers and teachers. Jesus seemed to have a new message, so that might have been getting their attention. Were they coming to see a healer? Many people were sick and hoping for healing and Certainly at many places where Jesus stopped, people would crowd around. Even as in the one story where they had to break through the ceiling of the house where Jesus was staying to let the man down on his cot so that Jesus could heal him. Or were they looking for a king? But not a king like King Herod, who was a proud and violent man, who taxed them so that he could build fancy palaces to try to be more like the Romans. They wanted a king who would free them because they remembered that generations before, the Maccabean kings had freed the people of Jerusalem and the area around from oppression by the Greeks. And so some of them were probably hoping that Jesus was going to start a rebellion as well and be a new king. But as I say, he wasn't like King Herod. He wasn't focused on earthly power. He wasn't focused on wealth. We remember that in the story of Jesus' birth, it says he was born in humble circumstances, descended from the line of David, but not born in a palace like Herod. That year when I was in Jerusalem, I made an attempt to participate in many of the big holidays and events. At the time, I wasn't sure if I'd ever go get back to Jerusalem, so I figured I, I should participate in many things as possible. So on Palm Sunday, I went up, found my way up to the Mount of Olives, and joined in the procession. And there were many pilgrims who had come from around the world, and so it was really wonderful to hear people singing in so many different languages. And, and it was, was an exciting event. And as we finally got into the city, there was a courtyard where people were gathering and singing and making the palm branches into some very, very complex weaving. I, I, I've figured out how to do this part. I haven't you know, done some of the other kinds. And it was so wonderful. But at the same time, it reminded me that those same pilgrims later in the week, would be retracing Jesus' steps on the stations of the cross, moving towards his crucifixion. And while as Christians we identify with Jesus, it's important to remember that if we had been there, 
we probably would have been more like the crowd that started out excited at the beginning of the week and turned on him. It's not just a matter of reading the story and saying like Peter tries to say, well, I will not abandon you. Because instead, I think we would be more like Peter who denied Jesus and the apostles who fled. Some people even ask if we'd recognize Jesus if he came today. And if you've ever looked at pictures of Jesus, some of the pictures that make him look like a, you know, European, blonde, blue-eyed guy with long hair, sort of like Fabio. I don't think we'd recognize Jesus just physically. But would we recognize Jesus if he appeared before us, preaching and challenging the political structures of our own time? Would we recognize Jesus and follow him like the disciples? Or would we be calling the authorities and saying, this man is trouble, get rid of him? The Gospels also tell us that many people were uncertain about Jesus because of the unsavory company he kept, because he didn't fit their expectations. But would he fit ours? There have been stories sometimes, and some of them seem a little bit far-fetched, of pastors who have shown up at their own big churches sort of incognito. There was a story one time, and again, some people have questioned if it really happened, a pastor of one of these mega churches who disguised himself as if he was a homeless man and walked into the church to see how people would respond. And even though the people of his church were always talking about how they cared for the poor and how they wanted to help everyone, people sort of made a very wide path for him because nobody wanted to speak with him. Nobody wanted to be near. And then he later got up and removed that disguise and stood on the platform and said, you didn't even greet me the way you're supposed to. People ask sometimes, what would Jesus do? And I think sometimes the, our assumptions or our claims about what, would Jesus, what Jesus would do are more about us and our assumptions than about Jesus. Jesus seemed to challenge most people's assumptions at the time. And I think if Jesus were here now, he would be questioning our assumptions challenging us, maybe even upsetting us to make us think about what it would be to follow God. The Bible uses this royal imagery, goes back to some, as I said, it goes back to some of the stories about David coming into Jerusalem, riding also on the donkey. One commentator pointed out that this is not saying so much about Jesus as about the way the people treated the kings of their time, the expectations they had for their kings, that their kings would give them good leadership, that they even called God king, that it says more about the people and their political structures than it really says about God. Because many kings in the ancient world were violent, unreliable, power-hungry. Even David supposedly one of the best kings, abused his power. So when we call God king, we're not saying that God is like those kings. Instead, perhaps we're saying that God sets the example of what kings should be. If the people had been happy with King Herod, they wouldn't have been so excited to hear that a new king was coming into town. They suffered under Roman rule. Pilate was certainly not a friend to the Jews, although the gospel story tells us that by the end, Pilate and Herod made friends over Jesus' arrest. As I said, King Herod was certainly not a good man and used his wealth, used the wealth he gathered from the people to support himself to make the city fancy. And most people were kept there at the bottom. So along comes this guy on a donkey. He's been saying strange things. He's been healing people. There are rumors that he's of royal descent, or maybe even that he's saying he's the son of God. Although even the word son of God does not necessarily mean literally son of God, but that 
Sometimes prophets and kings themselves were spoken of as God's children. So they're excited. Maybe he's going to challenge Herod, kick Herod from the throne. But then he doesn't do the things that they expect. So rather than stopping and thinking, well, why is he challenging this, challenging us? Just like the prophets often challenged the people, instead they get mad at him. Because they're expecting an earthly king, and he keeps saying things like, his kingdom is not of this world. Well, if, if he's not here for an earthly kingdom, why is he even here? This morning I read something that someone shared from Howard Thurman, an African-American theologian prominent in the 20th century. He said, I wonder what was at work in the mind of Jesus of Nazareth as he jogged along in the back of that faithful donkey. Perhaps his mind was far away to the scenes of his childhood, feeling the sawdust between his toes in his father's shop. He may have been remembering the high holy days in the synagogue, with his whole body quickened by the echo of the ram's horn. Or perhaps he was thinking of his mother, how deeply he loved her and how he wished that there had not been laid upon him this great necessity that sent him out on the open road to proclaim the truth, leaving her side forever. It may be that he lived all over again that high moment on the Sabbath, when he was handed the scroll and he unrolled it to the great passage from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, to preach good news to the poor. So I wonder what was going through the mind of the master as he jogged along on the back of that faithful donkey. We begin Holy Week today with this celebration, with these palms. In Jewish tradition, the the palms are actually waved in the fall at the festival of Shavuot, the harvest festival. But Christians have adapted this to be a symbol of Holy Week, a symbol that starts out with excitement, that, as we read this morning, moves quickly to fear and chaos and disappointment. But one of the things that I like about Holy Week and these symbols is that we can transform these experiences. We can take them, take something that was difficult, and challenging and fearful, and we can turn it into something else. That we don't have to just stop with the one part of the experience. We can change it, change how we look at it, change how we remember it, change what we do with these experiences. And so that something that was exciting, but then also mixed with scary moments, can turn into something that is ultimately, for us, a symbol of hope. As we begin this week, our walk to the cross, let us consider what we're hoping for, what we're desperate for. Let us ask whether Jesus meets those expectations. And if not, will we push Jesus away, or will we perhaps change what we're looking for? Amen. Our closing hymn is number 268, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And because the verses are short, we'll sing all four. Amen. Uh-huh.
For our benediction, I'm going to use the benediction that they use at one of the churches in Jerusalem that I attended many times during my time there. May the child of Bethlehem bring you joy. May Jesus, our good shepherd, bring you peace. And may our risen Savior bring you hope. Amen. And all God's people said, Have a good week. I hope to see a lot of you on Monday, Thursday and on Easter Sunday.